Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar today. My name is Chris Day. I'm Director of Engagement for CQC, and this is one of a series of webinars looking at how we're changing and improving our approach as a regulator. Before I introduce my colleagues, I just wanted to confirm that this session is uh, is recorded and so will appear on both our YouTube channel and also in the bulletins and in Citizen Lab. So if you have colleagues that can't make today, they can hear it uh, again later. Uh, firstly, let me introduce uh, my co-presenter, Kate Taroni. Kate is our Deputy Chief Exec. Uh, Kate will need to leave because she's about to attend another event at uh, just before uh, half two today. Uh, so she'll be handing over to me to finish the rest of the, the, uh, the slides today. And I'm also joined uh, for the Q&A by Amanda Hutchinson. Amanda is um, the leader for whom, who much of the work in terms of the design of our new framework. So uh, Amanda will have um, will help me with through the Q&A in terms of questions that you might have. And then um, we'll also have uh, colleagues from, from my team, uh, Sam, Jen, Sarah, Abigail and Steph, who many of you will know from the engagement team, they're working to ensure that, that today runs as smoothly as it can. We hope you find it useful. Um, just to help people who are new to webinars, the way the webinar is set up, it only allows for webinar members uh, to speak because there's so many people on the call over uh, 1700 at the moment. But you can use the chat function at the side of the screen just to ask questions, uh, but also feel that when you when you do so, if it's useful to post your, your name, just so we know who you are. Um, we're only trying to be answered questions related to the webinar topic today, but don't worry, all the feedback's recorded and we'll come back to any, issue, any other issues outside this meeting. Uh, the slides will also be sent to you after this event um, so that uh, to, with the, together with the recording, you've got a useful resource to pass on to colleagues in your organisation. So you, you'll have seen that uh, at the, uh, the end of last year, we outlined our new timeframe uh, for the launch of our new regulatory approach and the portal. Today's webinar will update on this time, this timeline and what it means for you. Earlier today, we held a different webinar looking at our approach to local authority assessment this year. If you miss this, you'll be able to find it on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, we'll send the link um, uh, so when it's ready. Uh, next week, we're taking a, a similar approach to our ICS assessment work. And again, if you haven't signed up to it and, and wish to sign up, uh, we'll share the link to do that shortly. So a quick overview of what we're covering today. Uh, we'll, we'll recap uh, on uh, how we're changing and why. We'll, we'll talk in more detail. I think the three things that are important to me are the need to have a greater focus across local areas and systems as well as individual providers to need to ensure that our new regulatory uh, approach helps people like you trying to deliver good care uh, and, and ultimately it, it's less complex and more and more efficient in the way that we interact with it between ourselves. Uh, moving on, we'll also uh, uh, look more about in detail at the, the new single assessment framework and the new provider portal. And importantly, uh, when you will, uh, will be bringing, be brought into those changes and how we intend to work with you. At the end of the Q&A, your chance to ask questions um, on what you've heard today. Uh, and then we'll look at the next steps and how we will keep in touch with you um, as we move forward with this project. OK. I'll hand over to you now, Kate. Lovely. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Really pleased to be um, joining you today. Some of these I'll fly through quite quickly because you may have heard um, the content before and I know you want the new stuff, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. A little reminder about why we're changing here at CQC. So we know we have an ambition to be a um, relevant uh, regulator regulated through the eyes of people with lived experience. We know it's critical that we have a greater focus on care across local areas and systems and that we really understand quality and risk within a place. We've got new powers that have gone live at the beginning of April uh, that we uh, need to be able to use effectively. We want to make our regulation less complex and more efficient. We want to regulate in a smart way um, and we want to work better with the sector um, as it recovers and changes from uh, from the pandemic. So that's why we're changing. Um, so our transformation work is, is kind of been you know, informed and shaped by three key things. And firstly, our strategy that is actually almost two years old. I can't, can't quite believe that we published it back in May 2021 um, and that strategy set out our ambition about being a, a smart, proportionate, effective regulator. We, along with every other organisation um, everywhere, learned many things through the pandemic, but we really wanted to build our transformation on our learning from the pandemic about how we can make sure we used every bit of intelligence, every bit of data we have on uh, providers, on uh, the people, the information we get from people who give us feedback on care to inform our understanding of, of quality and risk. 
and we've got these new powers that have gone live in in April. So those are the three kind of drivers for our, our work um, and that's why we are making the changes that we're setting out today. So what's going to change? So our strategy in order to deliver the vision of our strategy has required quite significant change for us in the organisation. People change, process change and, and systems change. So um, we are building and have built new technology to make it much easier for providers and for people to interact with us, to share information with us and to get the information that people, uh, often the public need when they're coming to us as the regulator to find out about the quality of services. We've built a new way of assessing. Um, we've built a new single uh, assessment framework that I'll talk to you about shortly. Um, that will be the, the same framework we'll use regardless of whether you're a large acute trust or a small home care provider through to local authorities and up to integrated care systems. To deliver our vision of making sure we have a really good understanding of quality and risk, we are reorganising our people within uh, the Care Quality Commission. So um, as of again the 3rd of April, so very, uh, very recently, about a week or so ago, we brought together our specialist inspectors, so specialist adult social care inspectors, specialist mental health inspectors, specialist primary medical services inspectors and, and specialist hospital inspectors into single integrated assessment and inspection teams. So uh, I'll use this uh, opportunity and I will repeat it because it's incredibly important. We are absolutely retaining the specialisms of our inspectors. So if you're a um, if you're a GP practice, you will still be inspected by a, a primary medical services inspector. If you're an adult social care provider, the same. But actually, we want to bring these single these teams together into single teams so that they can share their intelligence. They might go out and do joint inspections when we're looking at pathways, and they can inform our understanding of quality and risk within a place. Um, and what will change is these new powers that went live on the third of April around uh, assessing local authorities and integrated care systems. So um, a, a slide that you might be familiar with, but again, as I say, it's important that everyone who's on this call has the same uh, understanding of what we're talking about. So we're moving away from uh, currently four different assessment frameworks, one that we have at registration and other assessment frameworks, depending on whether you're a health or a social care provider, to, to a single assessment framework that we are we have embedded and aligned with what matters to people. So we've worked with Think Local App Personal, with national voices, uh, etc., to help align what matters to people to how we regulate. So just going around the circle, starting with the the, the cream uh, the cream quadrant, we are keeping our five key questions: is, is it safe, effective, caring, responsive, and and well led? But we are aligning them to think local app personals eye statements. Underneath those five key questions, we are replacing our extensive key lines of inquiry and we're replacing them with 36 quality statements. And that's 36 quality statements for providers and a subset of those for local authorities and for integrated care systems. And those quality statements are expressed as we statements. And if you hit the quality statements, if you're satisfying that, then you will be delivering a good level of care. So quality statements are expressed as what we would find uh, uh, as a good level of care. Underneath that, we have evidence categories. We have six evidence categories uh, that, that spans from observation of where care is being delivered through to feedback from staff, through to policies and procedures, through to outcomes for people. And the purpose of having those evidence categories is to be really clear uh, for our uh, people. Apologies, uh, someone started drilling in the room that I'm in uh, next door, so hopefully that's not too distracting. Um, so we've got six evidence categories that will make it really clear about what is what's a sufficient amount of evidence to gather to have formed a, a view about the quality of care being delivered in that area. It will also support my inspectors to know when is enough evidence captured to satisfy the requirements in that front. And then the final bit of the circle, uh, the purple bit, is, uh, is the ability to flex our, so we've got a single assessment framework, but we, we have the ability to flex what evidence we're collecting um, and what um, quality indicators we're looking at, depending on your, whether you're a large integrated care system supporting uh, the population the equivalent size of Wales, or whether you're a, a small home care provider looking after five people in their own homes. So, um, and all of that will be underpinned by uh, best practice and, and guidance. So that's just a reminder about our single assessment framework, our new methodology. Um, so we shared um, some information about this, uh, this uh, um, our new single assessment framework. Uh, we shared it a little while ago. So our 34 quality statements have been published and they're grouped under those five key questions I referenced. 
We've provided um, information about the evidence categories that we will be collecting to satisfy uh, what we're looking for for those quality statements. And we've also shared how we plan to assess um, services new, using our new regulatory approach. So that's already there and available for you. And no doubt the team will be able to drop a link uh, to you um, if you've not had access to those already. So just a quick recap of how things are going to feel different. So we're moving away from multiple assessment frameworks to the single assessment framework. We are moving away from um, a, a kind of real focus on going out and inspecting based on a previous rating. So we, we've always been responsive, but a, a large amount of our work was triggered by if you were a service rated as good, it would be a little while longer before we come back out and see you. If you were a service that was rated as, as inadequate, we'd come out, come back out again a lot sooner to, um, a, to a, a, a much more up to date um, view of quality and risk that would inform our, our activity. So moving away from uh, inspection activity uh, predominantly being driven by previous ratings to a much more agile way of, of when what would trigger kind of a regulatory intervention or, or activity. Um, so we're moving away from therefore uh, evidence predominantly gathered during an on-site inspection, so a single point in time, to evidence gathered at multiple occasions. So uh, feedback we get from people who receive services, notifications, intelligence we get from local authorities and health partners, um, along with um, information that obviously yourselves as providers share with us regularly as well. So the ability to have a much more up-to-date view and to share that view with the public as well about what we know about services. Um, so currently we have judgments and ratings uh, based on our, our, our ratings characteristics and we're going to move away from that to evidence categories that will be scored on a scale of one to four. So we're going to capture evidence, we're going to score that evidence and we're going to be really transparent about that with you as well. So not only uh, will this support our, our drive around kind of consistency, but also our ambition about supporting providers to improve. So you'll get your um, you'll get your report, you'll get your um, evidence category summary, you'll get a rating and then you'll be able to look at other um, equivalent services and, and, and understand what their rating was, their score was and, and what um, evidence we found in order to, to reach that judgment as well. And then finally, um, we know that a lot of people use our uh, inspection reports to form decisions about where to access care. Um, we know that a lot of people use our ratings and a lot of people look at maybe the first couple of pages of our inspection report, but bar our providers, um, members of the public often don't wade through our, our rather lengthy inspection reports. So our, um, our, our one of our changes is going to be about enabling us to provide um, kind of shorter, narrative, more narrative based um, reports that are easier to access for the public as well. OK, I've got two more slides. Um, so I, 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 we debated whether to put this in for you or not, but I thought you might be interested in changes we're making around our, since our new local authority powers went live. So, so very quickly, new powers uh, came into force on the th uh, on the 3rd of April. We are going to be over the next kind of two years or so looking at um, uh, our single assessment framework for all uh, 152 local authorities. But over the summer, we're going to focus on looking at all 152 uh, on two quality statements. We're going to look at how local authorities um, arrange care, um, how they work in an integrated way and how they ensure continuity of care and then we're going to look at how they assess uh, needs. So we're going to look at those themes across every local authority. We're going to aggregate up our, our findings and themes and that will go into our state of care report. We're going to do five pilots over the summer to test out our full methodology with five local authorities who have volunteered to be a part of that. Um, we will then from September onwards be doing uh, up to 20 uh, um, full local authority assessments that again we will be forming a view, we will be publishing and we will be sharing our ratings and then that will be the start of the kind of two year baselining um, of, of um, local authorities. And the reason why I thought it would be of interest to this um, audience is I'm always acutely aware and have been since I arrived um, in CQC and started speaking to providers that the way that you are commissioned, your uh, the way that your care is commissioned significantly impacts impacts on your ability to deliver high quality care. So um, I think for, for a number of you, um, this is probably a, a good news that we will also be looking at what role commissioners have when it comes to ensuring people get high quality care. And then my last slide um, is around our approach around integrated care systems. So again, powers went live um, back on the 3rd of April. We're going to be looking at one um, quality statement for all 42 um, integrated care systems over the summer. 
and that's equity and access. Um, I think many of us are very, very keen that we support ICSs to be very broad in their focus um, and resist the, the temptation to become uh, orientated towards what's going on within the acute setting, but, but also to take a real, uh, real interest and focus in what it means in terms of their population. So uh, looking at equality of access first feels like an important area for us to consider. Um, we're going to be piloting with two um, ICSs again that who will be volunteering to do that towards the end of the summer um, and then that uh, we will um, from uh, 2024 that will be the start of our, our two year baselining again as we work our way around all um, ICSs and form a view. So um, lots of big exciting uh, developments happening when it comes to our new powers um, and uh, lots of work to be delivered between now and autumn time when we will start using our single assessment framework with um, providers. So back to you, Chris. Thanks, Kate. As you as you say, a lot of um, really important work to do there. I just wanted to follow it up with a conversation about a lot of that is a lot of that work is based on uh, the underpinning information that we hold about organisations and how we develop that. And we're in the process of developing a new online portal for the collection uh, and, and storage of that information. Many of you, um, if you've had a, a, a reasonably long history with CQC, will, will be familiar with um, long Excel spreadsheets disappearing off into uh, an inspector's inbox and at some, at some stage a, an information coming back to you. And what we're trying to avoid with this portal is a, is a situation where information flows off into a black box and doesn't come back. We're also trying to make it easier, easier to register, easier to submit notifications, and easier to access information. Um, we're, what we're trying to do with this is to build uh, this new portal with you, with providers. Um, we'll ask you to validate the information that we hold about you, uh, but then we'll, we'll make it easier for you to access information and update it and easier for us to uh, access and update it. Once fully launched, all providers will be able to register with CQC for the first time, submit notifications and share information, apply to make changes to the registration and manage the use of their accounts, uh, contact preferences, online access as people come and go and change in your organisation. We are currently testing elements of the new portal with small groups of providers and thank you if you're on uh, on the call of being part of those uh, those groups. They are fantastically important to make sure we get this right both for us but also more importantly for you uh, and we're, we're really pleased with the involvement that we've had in in those groups so far the ambition of the portal isn't just about efficiency of, of the service isn't just about making sure we can we can uh, move information more efficiently in time we want it to be a place where you can understand where your data and information sits relative to other organizations and i think using that ability to sort of get a sense of how you are performing relative to others should be helpful for you, should help for your own planning, as well as the conversations that, that, that we would have together um, as a regulator. So, um, in terms of the when these changes are happening, I think what, what one thing I want to say just to sort of to, to, to caveat this slide is we want to work with providers and people who use services in the development of these really, really important changes. So what we're offering here is an opportunity to work with us in the development we, we want to uh, launch some of these changes incrementally, but take the feedback and take the uh, the conversations and uh, the, the, the points that we hear back from providers and people who use services as we build this. So our approach will be one that it'll come in several stages, making sure that we're learning from each iteration. Uh, but there's a firm commitment to ensure that providers have the information that they need to prepare for these changes. As we move towards the summer, we'll start to roll out the new provider portal um, and notification and notifying providers individually when they're able to sign up. We'll do this in stages to provide the right support and guidance. And over time, this will become our main online route for providers and their interactions with us. It doesn't stop the conversations with you and your individual inspectors or assessors, but hopefully it builds a robust way of having good conversations, particularly around the data that we hold and the information that you need to send us. In the initial period, it'll be quicker to submit information such as statutory notifications to us that way, moving away from the systems like email that we have at the moment. When we roll out the new assessment framework approach later in the year, providers will also be able to review draft judgments uh, through the new improved uh, process and uh, making checks like FACAC checks uh, easier and more quickly for draft reports. 
by making this available in one place, we'll make sure it's easy to interact with us, freeing up time to spend and also delivering frontline care. Um, we'll also continue to work with you on how we can improve this service. So it isn't just a, 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 a one size and a one change and that's it. There'll be incremental changes and improvements that we want to make to it. Um, one of the issues for people use services particularly is how we improve the give feedback on care service so that it's we're, we're more able to identify not just what people have said, but what's changed as a result and how we provide that feedback loop into uh, people's experience of care. Throughout this period, we'll, we'll, have, we'll review and publish the evidence from all the local authority integrated care systems across specific thematic areas, as, as Kate has said, and we'll also make sure that that information is available to you uh, individually, but also um, thematic to give you a sense of some of the areas of, of issue or concern that we might have. As we get into later 2023, we will gradually start to carry out the assessments of providers in the new way. This means using the new assessment framework powered by our new integrated assessment uh, 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 teams supported by our new technology. At this stage, providers will be able to apply and register with us, make ongoing changes to the registration through the portal. And by this point, all online interactions, all of the notifications that, that, we, uh, that we see and we have today will move to the portal, making it much quicker for people to be clear about what they've what they've issued. You've got a good history of the things that you've that you've offered. Um, but to allow more time for testing, we're also taking some decisions to to give ourselves more time for things like the enforcement processes. We wanted to make sure that we're absolutely right. So we've heard some feedback from from colleagues who've been involved in that pilot, and we'll make sure that we listen to that feedback as we um, as we begin to roll it out. Each step of this will be tested and developed with you and with people who use services. We will roll out when we are confident we've addressed it, all the feedback that we've received. So in summary, uh, we are delivering uh, an ambitious strategy of, as, as Kate said, of, of a couple of years ago now when it, when it uh, first rolled out. It's important we make sure that we're doing the right things in the right way at the right time and adapting our approach uh, so that you feel confident in us and can work with us uh, to develop the, 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 the outputs moving forward. We're learning from the feedback that you've given us and thank you again to the people who've been early adopters in, uh, in, on, on the call today. Um, we're, we're reviewing the, the, the rollout time frame to make sure there is enough time, not just for the technical testing, but the testing with you and also the time that you have to prepare for this new approach. Um, we know how important it is for, for you to have the right information at the right time and be ready for the changes. Across the rest of this year, we'll be delivering a campaign to highlight and share the information about what's available when. It will include more detail on the guidance and the support for you to use the portal well with you and your teams. Look out for the campaign. It will be uh, through emails, through bulletins, social media. There'll be blogs, there'll be podcasts and there'll be conversations like this. But it was really important from, from your perspective that you feel confident about how you use the new systems that are available to you. So we are open to uh, questions. I think uh, Sam and colleagues have been carefully uh, pulling the questions uh, for us forward. So I'm just going to. Uh, We've got some great questions, Chris, so far. Super. So I'll just I'll start picking out some of the some of the most popular ones um, for yourself and Amanda to answer. So I think something a few people have asked is is can we give some reassurance around the role of um, feedback from people who use services and their experience of the care in our new model and how central it is to our approach? So I wonder if we could say a bit more about that. And I know some people have also specifically asked about the role of experts by experiences, ex experts by experience in our new approach and whether they'll still be key. So if I, could, uh, Amanda, may, may I start that? If, would you want to come in? Is that, is that OK? Um, so. Uh, when I joined the organisation, experts by experience was one of the things that for me was so central to how we understand people's care. Ultimately, our ability to operate is based on the trust that we gain with people who use services and the trust that we gain with, with uh, people who provide services. Experts by experience were a, a, an important vehicle for making sure we got the right information from people who use services at the right time. Over the years that I've led the service, we've, we've actually expanded it to include 
um, not just um, uh, some on uh, some some of the services that, uh, like mental health and and adult social care where it was more traditional, but actually moved into other services like, for example, domiciliary care, where we've used it more to talk to people remotely about their experience of care. So it is absolutely central to our new approach and absolutely central uh, when you look at the, the 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 evidence categories. And Amanda can do this better than me. Um, that the 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 top evidence category is around people's experience of care. We know that where people feel confident they'll give us feedback sometimes and often that feedback is good uh, because their experience of service is good but if they're they're, they're people who use services and people who work in services are probably some of the best barometers of how services are really performing so experts by experience remains uh, central to uh, our, our, our thinking in terms of how we gather information from people they are one of a, of, of a number of uh, of tools that we use but the the importance of people's feedback in driving our understanding of of care uh, linking back to the i statements and the we statements is absolutely central so it, it will be experts by experience but it won't just be that we've seen a massive rise in give feedback on care over the last two years uh two three hundred percent rise in in that in that source and i think now almost one in two inspections are in part based on the on on feedback from people who use services so that is a very important part of our of our work going forward it relies upon us being able to be clear about what we've done with the information we receive which is why i mentioned that earlier on but they the feedback from people is is, is critical the feedback from service users the feedback from frontline staff is critical to to our thinking to our approach moving forward um amanda i don't know you may want to say uh more about that i don't know nothing nothing major to to add um but i think i think this does just un underline that whilst there's a lot that will change about the way we approach assessments there are quite a lot of things that that won't and i think some of those basic principles that we've had um from 2014 onwards about things like the importance of people's experience the importance of using um experts by experience and and also getting that kind of specialist professional input when we need it are um still absolutely key to yeah to to the way we're going about things agreed thanks both um this next question might be for you to start with amanda so it's a it's around evidence collection in the new assessment framework so i know some people have asked whether something like the provider information return is likely to exist in the in the new approach, but also whether we're we're also looking at other opportunities for providers to share information with us, like through the new provider portal, for example. Yeah. Um. So so we will still need, in some circumstances, to kind of proactively ask for information from providers particularly where we have gaps in 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 what we know or in in national data sets whether that is is kind of on that same sort of cycle as the sort of PIRs that we do at, at the moment I think is, is 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 less clear but given that our future assessment model is 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 about uh, a model that's that is able to be updated at, at, at any point in time and also doesn't just rely on um, an inspection every three years to to up, update ratings. I think that the process of, of requesting information is is likely to be more much more dynamic than it is now and much more focused on particular types of information that we we need. Um, equally, the, the, the portal will give that opportunity for people to submit um, evidence proactively with us. So again, a kind of one of the principles behind what we're doing here is, is that it is open to providers to share information with us where they think that will help update the rating um, and, and, and reflect in real time the quality of care that's been been delivered. So I think it's much more of a kind of dynamic open process than than the, the approach that we've taken so far on this. Did you want I to come in, Chris? I only to say I think I, I think that entirely agree with that. I think the only thing I'd say in addition to that is in, in the background of this as well, we've been working with national partners around how we can share information more effectively. So rather than 
a number of organisations coming to you for this effectively the same information. How can we share some of that information in the back end? But I think your point about the, the portal is really important because actually it, it rather than things being a sort of staccato uh, tied to an event every 18 months or a year or, or, or whatever, it actually becomes a more of an ongoing conversation about how service performance is changing. That isn't just about the provider your, your individual provider experience, but also might be about the system experience as well. So get that ability to share information more in real time that helps better understand the pressures you're under, the pressures people in your services experience and what that means for the system performance. I think it will be really, really important and using that that portal as a way of sharing some of that information, I think will be will be really important. Thanks both. And I think that the next question builds on that quite nicely. I know one of the anxieties a lot of um, people have expressed on the webinar is um, when there happens to be a large gap in time between CQC assessments and, and ratings of providers. I, mean, I wonder if we can say any more about how this new model will make sure we get that balance right between the, um, the, the frequency of reassessment of providers. Do you want to go, for, do you want to go first, Amanda, or do you want me to? I'm I I I'm quite happy to yeah, yeah expand a little bit on on this. So I I think it's sort of very much in line, um, as Sam said, with the previous question. So the 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 new model is is absolutely fundamentally kind of based on wanting to be able to assess providers more frequently in a more focused way with the intention of making sure that the information that's available to the public and to providers is, is, is up to date, much more up to date than the information that we share now. And the way the system will be set up, as it will allow for that kind of two way flow of information that will lead to uh, providers being able to, um, and CQC being able to reassess and update ratings more frequently than than it, than it does now. So the kind of large gaps, yes, absolutely, that that is is an issue. It will be much less of an issue going forward, um, and something that we are really hoping that this will tackle. Yeah, I think you think it's tough to say that periodicity based inspections were never an answer to trying to understand how health and care services are performing. But what we wanted to do was to make sure we had access to the real time information. And I think a combination of the, the new platform and the portal allows for better conversations about what information is coming in and what it says about the performance of an organisation. And I think this will take a bit of time to, to bed in. Uh, going back to my trust point, a bit, a bit a bit about how do we work with CQC to understand the issues and what we're trying to do about about our own our own performance. But I expect that to be something that we can more represent in real time how services are, are are changing than we can today. Thanks both. Um, the, the next question might come back to you Amanda. I think we've had a couple of people just wondering what um, what might change for those types of services that we regulate but currently don't rate. So thinking about dentists for example. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's nothing in here that's suggesting we're suddenly changing our approach and going to be starting to rate dentists. But did you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, no, I think I think that's exactly right, Sam. There's 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 we 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 can't introduce rating for services that we don't yet have the duties or power to 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 rate. We have, um, I think, some time ago, and and you know, in in consultation with with the sector, asked for powers to 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 rate dentists and, and other currently unrated services, but that that change to legislation hasn't been made yet. So the approach very much is 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 that we continue with the type of approach we take now, which is. Uh, kind of more risk based model based on uh, 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 assessing a number of, of, of services a year and, and making a judgment against against the regulations and, and reporting on on that basis. So that that doesn't change. And obviously, if it if and when it does change, we will um, signal that very clearly. Uh, 
because that that will be a, a kind of significant change to the way that we approach in particular dentists. Yeah, I'd agree. I think the um, there still be opportunities to share information in the way that we yeah. the way that, um, that, that, that the the new portal allows, but but it as I say doesn't fundamentally change the law uh, around uh, ratings of services. Thanks both. Um, so we've had quite a few questions about the new portal, and I think what what people are really interested in is. Um, I guess hearing a bit from us about our ambition for the portal to offer more functionality than it does at the moment. And I think some of the things people are really interested in is having more options around different people in an organisation, having different levels of an account within a portal, being able to have a two way dialogue about the information we, we hold about a provider through the portal um, and just generally it being easier and quicker to use and feel like a less um, clunky process. I don't know Chris if you want to say a bit about our ambitions in that space. Yeah I think clunky process is a is a is a is a, a probably a, a kind definition of how it operates now for people who are who are using it. I think all those ambitions are exactly where we want to go with this. So ultimately this should be in a sense it should be a helpful tool for providers as much as it is for us. It should give uh, provided colleagues the ability to create a number of different um, groups in, inside their organisation. So I might want to give limited access to people for these areas. I'm going to give more, more uh, a greater access over a number of uh, a number of different areas to other people. It gives you a better record of the things that you've you've sent in, and it gives us the ability to have an ongoing dialogue. And I think this is important for me around um, uh, 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 in between inspections. It gives us the ability to share information. If we share information, it gives you the ability to comment on information and to say, yeah, well, I can see why this has changed. This is the reason. These are the reasons why I've seen the same change myself. Eventually, over time, I'm really I'm really excited about the idea of, of trying to create a sort of a, a benchmarking tool that allows providers to see themselves relative to others and see where they're potentially performing really well or areas where they may be performing less well compared to other organisations like them. So I think there's tremendous, there's tremendous opportunity for the portal, but um, dragging myself back down to, to, to where we are, the most important thing as we begin this journey is that it's easy. That so all the transactions that we take um, around everything like death notifications, around changes to registration are easier. I think the key thing for me has to be easier, much easier to use the portal than it than it will do to take uh, a, an email or a phone call. So easier, simpler transactions. Yes, with a variety of, of, of different um, authorities that, that, that a registered manager can, can put forward so that they're, you're in control in the sense of your, your end of the portal. But a, a portal that, uh, uh, aside from being, things being easier, also gives us the ability to, to look back over time to get some useful management information about how things are changing over time and potentially, I say, that, that opportunity for benchmarking information so we can see how services are performing one relative to other. Each part of this process so we will develop with you and we will roll out when we are both you and I all of us are are, are happy that the, the service is doing the thing that it should. We won't roll out the service until we're absolutely certain that it's doing it's doing the right things and we've been doing some testing with with colleagues in registration to that end at the moment and I think we can get to a really sensible a much better place than we are we are today and, and eventually say create a, a tool that is not just an efficient, an efficient way of dealing with the regulator, but actually provides useful information to you as organisations. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I think we've we've also had some questions around um, addressing inconsistency in our approach. Um, and Amanda, I think it's fair to say that a big driver for the single assessment framework is to make it make it easier for us to be consistent. Yeah, that that that's right. So I think the key I think the, the key to the key to consistency is 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 transparency. Um and the way that we've structured the single assessment framework and other changes to the methodology are are absolutely about being transparent. Um transparent about the, the standards that standards that we're expecting um, services to achieve. So what that good service looks like, transparency around the type of evidence that we collect, transparency around um, the, the particular 
types and, and pieces of evidence that, that we, we may well be taking account of um, in making those judgments and then also the the kind of transparency around the process by which we're making judgments by by applying a, a score to the to the evidence that that that, that we collect so i think th say the whole assessment framework is is kind of structured around that principle and obviously that information being shared and easily available to providers local authorities ICSs all those kind of different levels of assessment that we'll carry out um, I think the the way that the assessment process is kind of built into our regulatory platform system will also make it a lot easier to kind of do routine quality assurance kind of sampling will enable our kind of inspection managers to be looking more closely at kind of what's going on with within their in their teams so it i think it's yeah it's it's all about consistency um and also obviously a lot of those um, processes that we already have in place, for example, the kind of factual accuracy process, again, that will be carried through into the new way of doing things. So there's also that, still that ability to, to kind of challenge the accuracy of, of, of the judgments that we're making. I think your point about um, the transparency of, of what we're asking for here is, is, is critical. But I think the other thing that you, you made mention of, but it's, it's really interesting, is because of the way the technology has changed. As we do hundreds of, of assessments over the course of a month and a, um, thousands over the course of a, of a year, we can see how similar groups of evidence led us to a particular conclusion in other assessments. And I think being able to sort of be consistent with ourselves collectively in different parts of the country over, over time is really is really important and what one of the things that the technology does for us it gives us an ability to say well in this type of situation this is what this is what we we tend to 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 judge this organization as and i think that's an important uh, an important tool for us but it's an important way to build some additional um consistency in there'll still be the processes that we have of peer review within the within the organization but i think in addition to using that technology to give you a, a guide on where information is scored in a particular way these are the types of judgments that we tend to make i think will be will be important as well one thing just to add on on the on as we as we begin to make judgments and ratings um for those who've been around for a while remember we went we began the five key questions work many years ago now we did some work on shadow ratings for a period of time where we we just tested our understanding of ratings and before we developed it we'll absolutely do the same again this time so we'll in our initial rollout of this we'll want to test our our thinking uh, around ratings with working with you we also need to think about how this looks for people who use services to make sure that there is a um, a, a position about what we say about an organization for people who use services as as kate said earlier on often people use the first two pages of the report and then they they don't tend to read further which make need to make sure that the the piece of information that they do gather is it give, provides a succinct overview of what we think today and potentially what where the organization is moving next Great, thanks, Amanda. So we've also we've also had some questions, um, some more questions around how we'll use evidence in the new model. So I think particularly um, wanting some reassurance that we we will be looking for evidence of good quality care and good practice. We're not just looking for uh, evidence of uh, poor quality. And I think also a, a question about how we'll assure that the evidence we collect is correct. And I think people's reflecting some anxieties on the webinar that, that there may be um, people who feed back to CQC who don't necessarily share accurate information and what we might put in place to make sure we um, assess only on um, accurate information. Um, I don't know if Amanda or Chris, if you want to take that first. Do you want to go first now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I could have a go at both of both of those. So I think the first question was was about are we looking for evidence of good care? Um, so yes, the answer is, 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 is yes. This is very much a model that's about making sure that all dimensions of quality are, are, are reflected in the, in the judgments that we, we make. Um, 
we've been kind of con conscious that that you know there is there is a the potential for a, a kind of model where you are relying on information that you, that you receive um, through a kind of monitoring process. The, the, a system that relies on that can actually um, default to only looking at evidence of of poor care. So so we're 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 putting a, a kind of system and approach in place that makes sure that for all types of service, we're also proactively going out and gathering evidence against particular quality statements or evidence categories that is absolute and that's absolutely about making sure that we are collecting evidence that will allow us to to kind of continue to reflect where service quality is improving as, as, as well as where there are, are concerns about care. I think on the other point, um, obviously around the kind of accuracy, accuracy of, 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 of evidence and the way I suppose a, a particular piece of evidence might kind of skew uh, an assessment if that isn't properly triangulated. I think it, I think it does come back to as as now we we don't look at evidence or a single piece of evidence in, in isolation of, of everything else that we know about a service, about its kind of past and, and current performance, and, and that it's absolutely kind of open to our inspectors and, and assessors, as they do now, to use their judgment to decide whether they need to collect further pieces of evidence to, to kind of gather to, to validate what they're finding, whether they need to go and talk to people, whether they need to request some information from from providers. So there will absolutely be that kind of triangulation and, and moderation across different pieces of, of, of evidence in, in, in the way that there is now. Just to build on, on your first point, Amanda, um, one of the other area of our strategies around um, improvement and innovation, and I think there's a real the, the re, what I one thing that I like about the I statements is it 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 sort of tends towards an expectation of good, and within that you've got the ability to demonstrate innovation as you think about how services are delivered. So you're not geared towards you must do this thing, but we're looking for something where people would say uh, they're receiving a good service. So really important for me that we can do that we think about the environment we're in at the moment we're in a unprecedented sort of uh, stint of very high demand uh we're in unprecedented times in terms of um the the the, the real sort of concerns around uh, uh, uh quality and access to services so we are looking for innovation and in what organizations are doing just before christmas we uh we we uh, created what we call the innovation hub which is where we're asking our own inspectors to think about what they were seeing and that was new and different and that might actually be an innovation that can be shared across the wider organization so we are absolutely talking to our colleagues about being curious about innovation and why it happens being curious about what what's changing out there and how uh, as a guide for what we might say in our own publications to to and what we might say back to central government around things that we need to see uh, supported and changed differently but but really important that we've got a strong emphasis on 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 improvement and innovation not just on uh, where 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 services are struggling thanks both um so i think we've We've also had a, we've also had some questions about the the balance we might need to take in our approach in the future. So it's um, we're able to deliver our responsibilities as a regulator, but we're also supportive of providers who are operating in sometimes quite difficult circumstances. Um, I wonder, Chris, could you say a bit about this and and yeah, yeah, where we might want to land on this. Yeah, I, I, so I think. I think it's important to understand context when we're looking at services and, and actually um, Amanda and I, we, we've been in CC a while and we, we were both reflecting on the fact that we're, we're really glad to have got system regulation back as a, as a thing because looking, being able to look at, at, across a, an area, looking at a number of different services and how they operate gives you better context for how services operate so we've been doing as as uh, kate said we're doing some initial assessment work around ics's and around local authorities where that starts 
is often around what's the environment that an organisation or, or an area sits in. So what are the underlying social demographics? What are the underlying uh, issues around inequalities? And then how is an ICS, how is a local authority working with providers to address those issues? So I think there's two things to say. One is it's important to for systems to understand where they start and what is what, what are the issues in their area. And then it's important for us to be able to understand that as we look at both assessments of, of providers and of uh, and of and of systems. Um, this is new work for us. We haven't done this for 12, 13 years. Uh, so it's a it's an important step for us to be able to contextualize some of that. We'll also it, it does still require organizations to pull their levers to what, what are the things that they can do as individual organisations. So it's important for us to recognise from the conversations we have as part of our ongoing um, uh, uh, conversations with um, with providers through our inspectors and through our assessors, what are they doing and how are they managing in their environment? And then it's also important to think about what are the things that sit in an, in an, in an area perspective, in a, in a system perspective that actually are are systemic issues that need to be thought of either in ICS and LA or potentially even at a national level. So um, I'm, I'm really one of the reasons why the single assessment is so important, going back to something Amanda said earlier, is it, it joins the dots between an assessment of uh, a provider and an assessment of a system using effectively statements that are similar. So I and we statements, but they're, they're built from the same premise. And I think that gives us our best chance at, at showing how organisations are performing and how they're performing in the context of the system that they operate. And I don't know if you want to say any, any more about that. No, nothing, nothing to add to that. Thanks, Chris. Thank you both. Um, and I know we've, we've also had quite a few questions about the, the timeline for implementing these changes and when we think we might be able to be more precise with, with dates of when things like the new portal and the new uh, single assessment framework will launch. Um, I realise we might not be able to give specific dates on this call, but I think we can give some reassurance that we absolutely recognise providers need significant time to prepare yeah. for these changes and we are building in that that time to share information in advance of the changes coming into effect. It really important to say that, Sam, and I know I said it earlier on, but I'm just to reiterate that point. So there's there's there's, there's um part of the reason why there, there's a as always with these things, there'll be somebody somewhere. There are lots of people uh, with a very detailed spreadsheet. But what what I want to make certain happens is that the feedback from people who services, the feedback from providers informs the eventual successful rollout of each of these products. So we talked about um, uh, moving some of the um, the new online uh, uh, portal uh, submission uh, uh, um, documents, so the new the new ways in which we might um, uh, pull information in from the summer. We were testing each one of those. We want to test each one of those with uh, for, for registration, for, uh, for notifications, with, with you, with providers, so that we know that the system works and works for you. Then, as you said, Sam, it isn't just a question of testing the technology to make sure it works. We then need to give you enough time to ensure that you can uh, support any training that you need to do in, uh, in, internally. Though hopefully there won't be a lot because it should be relatively intuitive. Um, and to be, make sure that you understand uh, what lies in the detail of the, of the, of the new assessment framework. So uh, we're, we're trying to uh, do that over what would be sort of now until uh, uh, July, August. And then from August onwards, we'll, we'll gradually begin to roll out the elements of, uh, of, of both the online portal. And as we move into uh, um, later in the year, um, the, the, the assessment framework itself. But I want to make sure and our colleagues want to make sure that each part of this is tested well with the people that are going to use it, both our end and at providers and people who services end as well. So we want to make sure that's done. We take on board any comments rather than rigidly stick to a date that doesn't allow us time to make sure we've addressed all the issues that people give us in that feedback. So that feedback is important. The campaign that I spoke about earlier, there'll be regular updates about what's happening, when, how that feedback's working, what we think in terms of the, the, the launch of particular elements of it. So um, please be you know, engaged in those conversations. 
I say thank you again for those people involved in the testing of this because it is a an important job to get right. But I'm if this works well, we should develop a system that is useful to us, but also useful to you. But the testing of that, the critical testing of that over the next six, eight months is is I think is critical to its its long term success. So if you want to say anything more about that. Um, and I think really, really just to to kind of plug what's already already there on the website in terms of, of the detail of the single assessment framework. And, and I think we kind of got the policy statements out there in the summer of last year. We since up, updated um, and there is quite a lot of detail on there in terms of the quality statements, evidence categories, the types of evidence that we'll be looking for, how we're going to approach scoring. So I think if, if you haven't looked there, it's 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 worth having a having a look um, to familiarise yourself with the concepts, but also some of the content as well. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Chris. Um, I mean, I'm just conscious of time uh, and I realise we haven't managed to get to everyone's questions. So just to kind of reassure people that we are, we will review all the questions we've been asked and um, come back with more information on the key themes that we haven't managed to get through today. But if I hand back to you, Chris, just to close out today's call. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for taking the time to join this webinar. Um, it's, it's important that we can continue to have a good uh, conversation with you about this. Um, as Sam said, there's some more ways in which you can keep up to date. So if you look on the on the slide, uh, you can get involved in our digital platform, Citizen Lab, share your, your experience, your expertise, your thoughts. You get to see some of the the earlier uh, sort of doctor information earlier if you if you if you join the Citizen Lab. So you get to review some of the documents, there are polls, there are surveys, um, and there are ideas board. So it's a great place to 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 a to hear about what we're doing quite early, but also to take part in some of that earlier early adopter uh, work. Um, the provider bulletin and the blogs, uh, so you can sign up for those and receive sort of up to date information uh, from us uh, about um, your sector straight into your inbox. Uh, it, they, they come out um, uh, relatively uh, frequently, usually fortnightly, just to give you an update on what's happening when. We've got the Twitter account for the most immediate stuff that, that, that that's that's coming out. And uh, CC Connect is um, if you're if the, if you um, uh, like to listen to things rather than just be a part of conversations, there's a series of podcasts that are available via um, uh, CC Connect. Uh, which are uh, everything from from talking a bit about um, single assessment framework uh, and uh, the the, the uh, ICS and LA assurance work to things like state of care. So you can sign up for those and listen to the ones that you're uh, interested in the most. But thank you, uh, thank you very much for your time today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you to my to my colleagues for uh, for the work that we've done uh, today. Um, and until next time. Um, look out for our bulletins, look out for the, um, the, the, the campaign as it begins and we'll, we'll get back to you with the questions that we're, we haven't been able to answer today. But thanks so much for your time today. Mm -hmm.